Evet, merhabalar. Hello. Hi Ben, we Hello. made it. Yes. We made it. Yes. <laughs> well done to us. Okay, let's just say hello to everyone. Um, hello and welcome to my very, very first Instagram live. I am so nervous and I'm just like this at the moment. And I believe it's the first for my friend Benjamin here too. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. We're, we're trying it for the first great. time together. I'm so great. pleased. Great. With what the a same great boat. moment to share. <laughs> Thank you for accepting my invitation to join me on this live and to talk about this very crucial topic. Now, two reasons why I wanted to do this and why I wanted to do this with you, Ben, is because this year mm -hmm. a lot has happened with the results. All the parents are trying to understand what's going on and what they can do um, in the aftermath. And then we have those parents who are new to the system, who are trying to learn the system and face this whole chaos. Um, now, I don't want to panic anybody, and there are loads of alternatives, and there are loads of things that they can do, but um, I'm sorry, this may be a bit late for some parents. It's only just fit into my schedule, and we've been really busy with the prep of the new year, uh, new academic year, of course, but um, you, with your centre in the heart of Oxford, having done this for uh, many years, right, is Benjamin here? Has he gone? Benjamin, can you hear me? I think your screen has frozen. Let's get him back on. Benjamin, hello. I was talking and you were gone. We're back. You're back. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. I was just I'm, saying, how I'm wonderful glad you are. I'm glad we told everyone for you that it was our first one. So, so people yes. aren't too surprised when we, when we <laughs> vanish. But well, no, I'm so sure I people heard, will understand that there can be thing, and I think you made such a good point there for you because it's been quite an unusual year, hasn't it, mm -hmm. for people with exam results? Because after two um, sort of completely unusual years during the various COVID lockdowns, where, as we know, schools were being asked to decide students' yeah, GCSE and A level grades based just on the year's performance. And then the first year after COVID, we had this year of what people thought of as very inflated grades, didn't they? Um, this is sort of the first normal, completely normal year again. And as we'll have all have seen in the news, and there have been so many reports of um, grades at both GCSE and A-level being much lower than the year before. Um, and it's a really unusual thing for us to see because traditionally um, in the UK, all we read about every year is that the grades are getting higher and higher and there's this grade inflation and more and more students are getting the top grades every year. So um, I think this question about uh, remarks and resits is, is a really important one because there are undoubtedly lots of parents and families out there who've really been taken by surprise mm. by the results mm. this year mm. and have expected that trend upwards to continue and suddenly are in a position where they've been taken by surprise and are thinking about what to do next. Good. Yeah. Now we're going to help them on, on what they can do next. And um, so first question is my very own personal curiosity, because I don't work in a school, but I work with many schools. This is something I've been asking to all the schools, you in your centre and many of the uh, state schools and public schools uh, alike. Did the teachers who provided predicted grades for their students no. Were they aware that this was going to happen? That's my first question. Did the government actually alert the schools that they're going to go back to a pre-COVID kind of grade boundary system? There was nothing official. Mm -hmm. So I think that there was sort of an expectation that things would adjust back at some stage. I think a lot of people were taken a bit by surprise, though, because it put a lot of pressure, I think, on teachers and schools that first year where the school assessed grades were just the final grades, you know, and it was even at that time a bit ambiguous as to what would happen, whether it would be partly school assessed, partly exam assessed. I think schools and the government at that first year were sort of feeling their way quite quickly as things changed so rapidly. So I think there was always an expectation that things would go back. Mm -hmm. But I think 
it's been a bit more abrupt than people expected. Yes, it has been a more of a shocking mm. um, situation. Now, let's start with let's start with the questions that I've emailed to you earlier. These are all the questions that I've gathered from the parents that know me, the parents that I work with, the students that I work with, and also um, I think it'd be good to take it, uh, you know, uh, one by one. Let's start with the GCSE system first. If there's any similarities with the GCSEs, then you can add in the A-level bits too. Mm -hmm. First question, is resit and retake the same thing, Benjamin? <laughs> it's such a good first question for you because you would think, wouldn't you, that they mean exactly the same thing. Yeah. Such this is a stuff. bit confusing for most, yeah. yes. Absolutely. And I think what makes it even more confusing is that the terms mean different things in different organisations. So some universities, for example, will use them interchangeably. But the key difference between both is not about the paper itself, but about the, what happens beforehand. So mm -hmm. generally speaking, a student who resits an exam um just retakes the paper itself retakes the exam in the hope of getting a slightly better grade no real intensive preparation beforehand they just book to take the exam sit it and that's that a retake generally speaking refers to a more extended period of preparation beforehand so that would usually be a student who were who was for example retaking year 11 Okay, so, so that's like a year uh, repeat. Exactly. So or, or in some cases, uh, a lot of our students, for example, just retake a term. Uh -huh. So they don't need the full uh -huh. year, but they retake. There's a program they follow beforehand, building up to the exam. Whereas a reset might be a bit more like you might think of retaking a driving test. Uh -huh. You've taken it once, you turn up, you take it again, and hope for the best. So that usually is the difference between the two. What happens? with the time planning though because we get results in the middle of summer mm. and then the student decides to retake or reset etc um what happens with the timing like it they have to like you have an they have to go to i'm sorry this is my series to talking to me now <laughs> <laughs> sorry just get rid of that um so the you know they've got to continue with a decision they've got to go to a college or a university how is that yeah. plan time i think with a levels for you timing is particularly important yes. because as as we all know students who have to make a certain set of a-level grades in order to proceed uh, take up their place at university are really under time pressure mm -hmm. because they're supposed to start in september you know in some cases it's just three or four weeks between results and starting university so and um, particularly for those students uh, i.e a-level um resitters, retakers or remarkers, the most important thing is to act quickly. So um, that's where we move on to this um, difference between remarks, resits, retakes, because for some students, if they know that they were very close to a grade boundary, then a remark is the best option to take. Um, and, and I think we'll talk a little bit about remarks further down the line. Yes. But if we're thinking about resitters, retakers, it's usually pretty clear if a student has um, been quite close to what they wanted or if they uh, are miles off, to be honest. And it's something we see the most with IB students, partly because they can choose to retake certain parts of the diploma. So one of the courses that's most popular for us at this time of year is IB retake students. Mm. But there's a session, you know, in November for the IB and the students don't have to retake the full diploma. So they might be one or two uh, points off of the grade that they needed uh, overall or in the specific subject. So many of our students retake one or two subjects rather than the full diploma in the hope of gaining one or two extra points and they can therefore take up a university place often in january or in the worst case the following year ben do um, you do i'm so sorry do you do this online as well as face to face in your center in oxford you absolutely do. so we have both online and in-person ib retake students and in in that sense the ib makes it a bit easier because that session is in november um whereas when we're thinking about gcse and a level um, there is an option for GCSE students to retake in November, but only for English and maths. I see. Yeah. Partly okay. because those subjects, as we know, are essential for students who want to progress to A-level or to jobs or to university. Is this in... uh, for all the exam boards, Ben? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, and that's November. 
for maths and English only. But mm. for uh, other subjects, then it's a case of waiting all the way until the next June. And I think that's why a lot of students choose not to retake the full year. Yeah. They might choose to just do uh, one term so that they have uh, a bit of time to get some work experience or do an internship or uh, do some travelling. And then they come back and start focusing really on the exam preparation, let's say from March, if they don't have much to improve, or from January if they have a bit more to. Mm. Is this, do you think, um, sort of like a, a good way to use the gap between your results and your start date if you're choosing a university with flexible start dates like mm -hmm. let's say january some universities in the uk are offering multiple entry mm -hmm. points and i think it's always good to have that gap give yourself a bit of a relaxation period after your intense revisions and then perhaps look into your results and do something mm -hmm. about them or, or travel before you start do you think that's that's wise that take up a january start and in fact it's something Thing that we see quite a lot of even for students in fact sometimes who've made the grades that they wanted particularly with international students a lot of those that we work with um, decide to not make it just a holiday not a complete break mm. but they might come to us for example from September to December to work on their English language or their academic English skills because um, that's something that will help them at university if they're studying in English or in the future for jobs or postgrad. So they're able to get a bit of a cultural experience somewhere uh, away from home, but still be working on something a little bit in the background. But I think it's essential for a lot of students to have that, that, that circuit right, break. Because, right, that's right. You know, for lots of these students they've been working pretty much flat out all the way through to um, 16 or 18 and to then go straight into more retakes or university you know it, it's how students end up burning out I think so this is why there's a uh, there's great statistics on the performance of the university first year students and why they fall below their A-level performances because they've kind of like as you said burnt yeah. out they've had enough they want to relax and they didn't have that chance yeah so um, yes, it's a great idea to take that that circuit break definitely, mm -hmm. and thank you for your opinion on that as well. Um, now the next thing is um, how this affects future applications. So let's say A level students decided retakes resets, mm -hmm. and obviously they've spent another year doing this, and they're starting university mm -hmm. a year later. We mm -hmm. call they can call this a gap year or retake year, but the universities will know. How is this regarded? How is this considered? And what universities like this and what universities don't? Mm. And what does it matter? Mm. I think it's an important question for you because understandably a lot of parents or a lot of students think the universities are going to, to absolutely hate it if they see that I've taken an extra year. And I think actually it's not necessarily the case. I think that what's important to understand is that for most universities, um, retakes are absolutely acceptable. However, what we will find is that some very competitive universities, so I'm thinking Oxford, Cambridge, perhaps UCL and some of the other Russell Group universities, and also some specific very competitive courses, particularly things like medicine or dentistry, will specify in their entry requirements that A-level grades must be achieved at the first time of sitting the exams. So universities where they are not willing to consider retakes will always be very explicit about that in their entry requirements. So my general advice is unless the university or the course explicitly says first time only, then retakes are absolutely fine. And in a sense, actually, students retaking A-levels, particularly if they're not retaking all of their subjects, are in some ways in a stronger position than first-time applicants, which might sound unusual to you, but I suppose what I'm saying is that for most A-level students, when they apply, particularly with the new linear system of A-levels that was introduced a few years ago, where all the exams are at the end of the two years, rather yeah. than the AS as before, when universities are considering students who are taking for the first time, the only things they have to go on are the GCSE grades and the predicted grades. Everything really to do with A-levels is a bit of an unknown. Yes. But let's say instead you have a student that managed to achieve ABC, for example, in A-levels the first time. When they're applying the second time round, the university will see that, okay, they're retaking two subjects, 
And so those grades are still to be confirmed. But also the student has the advantage of having that A grade that they're not retaking in the bank. So the university aren't having to base their decision on just three what ifs. They're able to see that there's one A already there. So the offer then is likely to be based on just two grades. So in some ways they're at an advantage because mm -hmm. they have an A in the bank. Well, which brings me to the question. This year we've had quite a few universities tell us that the native language A level will not be considered as part of the offer because it's taken a year in advance. Mm -hmm early sitters now this is the other thing retakes uh, may have some grades in the bank mm. but mm. how is early sitting considered mm. how is that um, it's a sort of viewed? good question and i think it's it's a difficult one particularly because it brings together two potential issues doesn't it it's the question of the early sitting and it's also the question of the native language and there are two things that, that students are often worried about because it seems naturally, doesn't it, um, obvious that a, that a university wouldn't consider, for example, an A-level in Turkish for a student whose first language was Turkish. But it's, it's not the case generally. Um, universities are pretty much all happy to accept um, a, a first language um, A-level to satisfy entry requirements. Um, and again, those universities that are not will always be very clear about that in their entry requirements as listed on their websites. So unless they have explicitly said no native language as an A-level, as one of your three A-levels, then they would be expected to accept that as satisfying the conditions of an offer. The second part of the question is about early sitting. Um, and in my experience, generally, universities are happy to accept students who've taken an A-level one year early in some cases with some of the sort of child genius students you read about in the news two or three years early so i think that each thing in isolation is not necessarily a problem for universities perhaps what some of those families that you mentioned earlier have found that it's the two things working together it's one that they were doing it sort of as an extra a fourth or even yes fifth that's right level, and the fact that it was early that the universities are thinking we won't accept it. But again, I think it goes back to this point about competitiveness of university or of programme, because generally speaking, the most competitive universities or courses will have the strictest requirements, as we know. And it's much more likely to be those courses, let's say medicine, for example, that would say, we're not willing to accept an A-level in Turkish from a Turkish student, or we're not willing to accept uh, an early take Turkish A-level because they might say that students are trying to take a shortcut and make them then able to only do two further subjects. So mm -hmm. the best advice on it that I can give is always to check the specific university and the specific courses entry requirements as published online as carefully as possible. Because although most of the advice I'm giving is generalised, some programmes are very specific about those things. But universities are in a very difficult position if they haven't publicised something they're not willing to accept. It's not available on their website. And then they start trying to argue that it's not acceptable further down the line. Mm. So first point of call, if in doubt, um, check the university website or even call their admissions team, particularly for international students. They're always happy to have a chat about a student's profile, what will or won't be acceptable. And it's a really helpful place to get some up to date advice. Great, thank you. Uh, now, the, the, the last, but not the least, um, <laughs> and however, the most important issue nowadays in everybody's mind is the remark process. I have had a record number of parents who ran to their schools for remarking. Yeah. They had no idea that the grade boundaries were raised. Mm -hmm. They were very high compared to the year before. And um, <clears throat> most of their teachers, be it private tutors or schools, have alerted them to this fact very late mm. and the parents panicked and um, almost everybody up to the you need you know this is something i'm going to ask you as well but up to a point of about 10 points difference mm. i don't know what's valid and what's acceptable and what's reasonable and what's logical mm. because a lot of people thought oh my god i was expecting an a i got a c mm. or or how's an a, a star student you know getting a b um this has happened yes absolutely. This, as i have witnessed this happen with loads of students this year 
I usually hold an A-level um, consultation clinic on the results day. People can phone me and ask me their questions, and then we can talk about yeah. what alternatives that, that they can they can do. And um, a lot of it seemed to be showing me the huge gap. And so I had to end up advising, go and see the great boundaries and see where you are. So let's talk about remarks in general. First of all, what's an acceptable remark application? And what's not an acceptable remark application in terms of the great boundaries? Mm -hmm. And if there's any subject specific uh, advice you can give? And also, uh, what sort of a timeline, you know, does this take usually? Well, I think the first thing to say for is you're quite right that this year there was a lot of panicked application for remarks, wasn't there? Because, as you say, before people looked properly at the boundaries, they were thinking, I was expecting an A star, you know, I got a C. Yeah. And there was a lot of this kind of panic. And I think, in a way, actually, having that immediate knee jerk reaction to go for the remark is not necessarily a bad thing because when you ask about what an acceptable um you know number of points is to be requesting a remark i think it's not necessarily as clear cut as that no because you could have a student who you know was two marks off but perhaps actually they were two marks off a grade which would have been almost unrealistic for them you know they're a b student they were two marks off an a not necessarily worth going for the remark but conversely, you might have a student that is five or six marks off, but really should have been getting the A, in which case it might seem much more that a remark is the best way forward for that. Now, the important thing when when thinking about this question of when is a remark appropriate or when is it a, a waste of time is that anyone can apply for one. Um, anyone can apply for a remark and critically, they're not free. You know, there is a cost associated with it. So I think in that sense, it's important to see it as a valid service. You know, if you as a student are not happy with the mark that you received or you think something went wrong, you're paying to have the exam remark. So you're entitled to have that remark. And again, a remark is not just the same person sitting down and checking. Yes, I'm happy with what I did. It is always a different examiner that will conduct the second mark. And it's and the mark is conducted completely fresh. So it's what you manual labor, isn't it? It's, it's not through a computer no, system. No, exactly, or, exactly. Or so you might read it from, you know, a different point of view on the exam script. Um, but the other thing to remember, of course, with um, a remark is that your grade can go down as well as going up. And that's something I always really highlight to parents and I'm sure you do the same for you when you're having your consultations because if a student is sort of mid boundary and they think you know I'll, I'll give it a go it's worth the worth the money to try for a higher grade we've had situations fortunately not recently but situations where students have ended up with a worse grade because they've gone for the remark so if a student is sort of has done quite well to get the grade they have my advice is always take it and run, you know, don't, don't, don't pay by, by going to the remark. Yeah. Um, in terms of deadlines and how long it takes um, for you, there are two options and it's the same for GCSE and for A-level. Um, you can apply for a priority review of marking and that takes 10 days. You can also apply for the standard review of marking and that is 15 days. Um, so it's quite, a long process even with a priority service you know if we're thinking about university admissions two weeks is a lifetime so i think my strongest advice particularly with a levels is as soon as you get the results get that request in straight away use that priority service it's worth the money if it's going to be the difference between getting into your university of choice or not and there are quite clear deadlines set for both of these services. So we don't yet know the deadlines for 2024, for next summer, but as an indication, this year, 2023, for A-level, the deadline to apply for a priority remark was the 31st of August. The deadline for the standard remark, 28th September. At GCSE, the priority was 7th September, and the standard, again, was 28th September. Now, if we're thinking about the A-level remarks, even with that priority deadline of the 31st of August, if you're waiting right up until that deadline, you've missed your university place, even by the deadline. But if you applied immediately on results day, 
so we're talking mid early August and you got your remark back in 10 days that could well be soon enough within to make your deadline yeah. your university place mm -hmm. so the strongest advice I can give on that is if in doubt get it in early get it in as soon as the results are in because otherwise you might be in a position where you're unnecessarily wasting another year sure 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 another question it is widely talked about that um sort of um, science-based subjects like maths statistics where the answers are sort of maybe multiple choice or optical reading there isn't much to change whereas on subjectively marked subjects like english essay-based tests like history sociology for instance there is more that can be done when remark is is asked is that true is that valid point? i think i think it's certainly not the case that it's a waste of time ever going for a science or maths remark um, but you're quite right you know although exam boards do all they can to lay out the assessment objectives clearly enough that in theory any marker would come to the same grade or any examiner you're quite right for you that quite naturally if you're looking at a 20 mark essay question in an english literature a level there is so much more scope for for subjectivity you know what one marker thinks is is badly written another marker might think is excellent so i do think that you see you tend to see the biggest increases or indeed the biggest decreases in overall marks in humanities subjects but you know we have to remember that even in a science a level or gcse it's not all one mark right or wrong answers there are still those slightly longer questions the four markers the eight markers so particularly if it's very close I think it's worth doing, particularly if there's a university or a school place up for grabs. But certainly you're right that subjects like English literature, history, geography, um, even economics, where there's much more room for subjectivity, I think those tend to see the biggest changes at Remark. Mm. Um, one final question from a parent mm -hmm. regarding the re retake resets. What sort of a revision period do you suggest? Do you think they should go to a course, take private lessons? How should they revise again for the I think it depends for you on two things. One of those is how uh, much the student needs to improve. And the other one is their style of learning. So if, for example, we had a student that had taken three A-levels, uh, wanted to retake one mm -hmm. and needed to go from a B to an A, I mm -hmm. think it would be absolutely ridiculous for them to sit down for a full one year retake programme of intensive tuition. It just would be unnecessary. Mm. And they also, I think, would start to become demotivated because they'd be thinking, you know, I could have, as we've said earlier, done some traveling. I could have done an internship in that time. Um, but if a student is retaking all of their A-levels and needs to improve by two, three grades uh, in each subject, then I think it is much more likely that that full one year would be needed. If we're talking about that student with one A-level to improve by one grade, I would say that there are two options um, on the table. One would be to do a one-term intensive period of revision. And for some students, most students, in fact, they prefer to do that directly in the run-up to the exam. Exactly. So if they're retaking in May, they start that in March, for example, and do two months. Other students prefer to do a slow and steady approach. So rather than a really intensive two months, they might do two, three hours a week over the course of the whole year. And they, and they build the knowledge, they, they revise more effectively in that way. So I think, it, as, as I said, it depends on their style of learning, one, and how much they need to improve by. A lot of our IB retakers in particular, because they have to often improve just, just by one point, and sometimes that's one point across three subjects they're retaking. So there isn't much necessarily to do. They generally join us in September, around now, in fact, a lot of our IB retakers just started, preparing for the exams in November. And some of them, those that have the most to improve, are doing 20, 25 hours a week for 10 weeks. Others are doing two hours a week for 10 weeks or for three weeks. We have some students that are doing a hybrid. So they're starting off with some less intensive online tuition. And then they're coming to Oxford for the two weeks before the exams to work with the same tutor, but on a more intensive basis. So. It's about style of learning and how much they need to improve, I think. There's no one size fits all.
Sure, sure. Thank you again. Um, it's been most informative even for me. Um, I've got some questions now from parents that are joining us. Um, oh, this one's totally <laughs> irrelevant, but I think you would be the pe best person to answer this. You come from a family of Oxford University graduates, and you yourself is an Oxford University graduate, and you've got tons of GCSEs and A-levels under your belt. <laughs> you've been an exemplary academic um, student in your time. So a parent says, asks, do you think it's easier, <laughs> I would have said better if it were me, but do you think it's easier to come to study at a university in the UK from within the UK or from Turkey, let's say? What do you think? What is your opinion? I think it's, it's a difficult one because although in theory universities should consider all applications equally, whatever the qualifications they've taken, nevertheless, it is the fact particularly at um, some of the more sort of historic or prestigious universities, that some uh, admissions staff just have a sort of um, a natural bias, an unconscious bias towards qualifications they know. So they think, I know A-levels, I know what this student will have covered, so it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's common ground with us. The other thing to think about is that almost all universities now have very strict caps on the number of international students they're able to accept. So it may be the case that for every 10 domestic students, they can only accept one international student. Um, and so undeniably, students applying from overseas are competing for fewer places than domestic students. Um, so I think those are really the things to consider. Um, in theory, application the best application should should get the places but I think there are a few reasons why I personally believe that studying A-levels will give you a more competitive chance uh, than studying for another qualification. So being an international student may give you uh, in terms of like a, a disadvantage in contingencies mm -hmm. but studying in the UK for the A-levels before you start your degree will certainly close that gap. Mm, I think so yeah. Yeah I think so. Do you think the university admission staff sort of get training on the various different qualifications that they get from around the world? Or are they, when you say the, you know, the, the bias, the, 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 they're not, you know, because they've studied A-levels. But the, I feel that, you know, sometimes you've got the IB coming up now, albeit 5%. You've got the AP coming up now for all the applications in the UK. And then you've got um, the traditional A-level route and you're going to get T-levels soon. Um, you've got some BTECs being accepted. So students coming from all around the world, from various different education systems, do you think the admissions officers are aware enough of their strengths and weaknesses? I think in theory, yes. And I'm sure that lots of universities do offer a lot of training on international qualifications. But um, I think that in practice, there are, I'm sure, some admissions staff that are really hot on it in the way that they should be and others that, that aren't as hot on it as they should be. Um, and I think when we're talking about some qualifications that are becoming more and more popular, things like AP, SAT or IB, I think probably by and large, most admissions teams know what they're talking about. But when you're talking about less common or more obscure qualifications, um, I have to admit for you, I almost always find myself in meetings with parents referring to the really helpful UCAS international qualifications document that's available online. You just search UCAS international qualifications. It's about 90 pages long and it lists country by country um, what the equivalent of that country's qualification is at A-level and whether it's acceptable for universities or not. Um, so, you know, I, I deal almost entirely with international students and I still find myself checking a lot of the time on that, you know, what is the qualification um, in Cyprus? What is the West African School Certificate equivalent? There's so many different configurations that um, you would hope that admissions teams would, would do the same thing and would look into it that closely but I think being realistic when you think about how many different applications they have to consider and how quickly I think it's unlikely that with some of those less well-known qualifications they do all of the background work that they should but I think that as a parent or as a student knowing exactly the situation 
according to that UCAS document or according to the university's website about your qualifications, knowing that information yourself will undoubtedly put you in a stronger position when applying to universities because you will know immediately whether your application is completely unrealistic or um, you know pretty pretty realistic or has a very strong likelihood of success so being as prepared as you can as a student might help to mitigate some of that lack of preparation on the part of admission staff and it shouldn't be the case you know you and I both know as people who work with a lot of international students that uh, these universities should know what they're talking about but when you think about the numbers of applications they're looking at I think we have to in some cases expect the worst and be prepared for it that's right. That's right. Thank you so much. You align a lot of my opinions here. Um, now, another question from me, because we've been working together for years, Benjamin, and you've helped quite a number of my students in both their preparations and their language skills and their academic skills and their essays. You and your team are doing a great job in supporting international students in Oxford. Um, and I'm very thankful for that. The question here I want to pose to you is... Thank you. It's been, it's been a great cooperation. The question I want to pose to you now is, you know that we work with a lot of students that come under 16 to the UK to various boarding schools or day schools with their parents or, or on boarding basis. And, and we use just services like yours to immerse them in the system and to help them get a boarding school experience and to help them make that transition as smoothly as possible. So please tell us, a, what the student needs to do to make this transition as possible, as smooth as possible themselves, and what it is that you do that is the magic. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you for your firstly, and as I've said, it's it's always fantastic working with partners who uh, know what they're talking about, as you undoubtedly do, but also partners who really care about their students, and it really makes a difference, and it makes a difference to the families as well, and it's why you have such an excellent reputation, you and your team, because Thank you. you can tell that you care, and you know what you're talking Thank about. You. They trust your recommendations, you know, and I think that reputation is is invaluable, um, and it's based on word of mouth and feedback over many, many years, so um, we will continue to be delighted to work with you and, and those families. And I think mostly the um, pre-boarding school students of yours that we've supported, the focus is on, on two things. One is generally um, the language side of things. And that's usually the side that needs the most immediate work. So in some cases, it's students that have got an offer from a boarding school and the school has said, you must study for six weeks of English um, before starting with us. They don't specify a grade that they need to achieve, but they say it has to be six weeks. Other schools say you have to reach this level of English before you start with us and we'll test you before you get the place. Um, so the language is undeniably one of the most important aspects. And we focus on that with all students on those courses. Two of the other um, key areas, I think, are a little bit more difficult to pin down. So one is about academic subjects. Um, and it's generally a case of um, style of learning and course content. So we quite often have students, for example, from, from China or Japan um, who want to start at schools and they're absolutely fantastic at science or maths, for, uh, which tend to be the two strongest subjects for students from, from those countries. But what they don't have is the experience of those subjects in the UK school context. And they're quite often complete topics that um, they just haven't covered because they're not part of the syllabuses in their countries or their approach to maths for example is just so radically different because the style of learning is very different often students from china for example are very used to just copying down from the board learning by rote and there's no encouragement of critical thinking or, or, or a more analytical approach so those are skills that we also try to teach so we're plugging the gap between their it's syllabus the, and the UK. And we're also addressing the style of learning and we're also helping them culturally to get used to what learning in a British school can be like. Because again, it comes back to that question about how they're taught to learn. Are they taught to debate? Are they taught to be critical in their approach? Or are they really expected just to memorise? And I think that that's something that can take quite a lot of parents a bit of time to adjust to when they're thinking about what their child needs to do differently or what they need to learn before starting a British school. 
it's not just about whether they're good at maths or good at history. It's about whether they are good in a way that will match the requirements of the UK system. So I think those three things really, language skills, style of learning and uh, different approaches and gaps in subject knowledge. Those are the three main things. Yes. I often find with the Turkish students, as a direct result of the way the system um, dictates, is that many students don't know how to write an essay. Yes. It's because they don't know how to develop an idea, how to um, create an antithesis, how to create a thesis in the first place, and then inquire an idea and then analyze and pose questions and find answers because of this many years of rote learning. And where they do become inquirers, then it becomes another um, trouble in their in their you know in their um, intellectual mind to be able to write those down because mm -hmm. processing is a, is is a whole different thing a whole new concept to their to their system they um, come from a system where they wrote learn the answer and are not able to talk about how they got to the yeah. answer be it verbally or writing mm -hmm. so that is that is what I find with my Turkish students and I always recommend to them whether you're doing maths, whether you're doing stats, whether you're doing English, always work written down, always use pen and paper, because the hand, the fine motor skills, actually codes everything to your brain, and it stays there, whereas the keyboard doesn't have that kind of connection with our brains yet. I agree, I couldn't agree more, and I think that one of the key skills that we uh, go through with all our GCC and A-level students, whether they're IELTS 7.5, 8 or IELTS 5, 5.5, is academic reading and writing. And even for those students whose spoken English is, is excellent, it's that skill of how to go over a piece of academic comprehension, how mm -hmm. to write an academic essay. And those classes can really make a difference to their final exam grades, because it's not just enough, it's not enough to just have good English. It's about having good academic English and being well prepared for exams specifically. And you're, you're right, it's that process often of writing things down, of learning how to answer a question, what exactly an examiner is looking for, how to write an essay. That's what makes the difference between a top grade and a middle, a middling grade, I think. Mm. Okay, cool. I don't think there's any other on, uh, questions I've been checking. Um, no, I did <laughs> promise to you. Hours for you. I know. <laughs> I did promise to you no more than half an hour, but we have <laughs> gone over that That's again. Fine. fine for you. I don't mind. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, let's get together on another occasion and talk about something else that that you know my parents demand of me, or you feel that you know Turkish students be would benefit from. This has been an absolutely informative. Um, um, great, great time with you. Thank you so much for your for your effort, for being with us, for your time and for your kindness. No Thank problem. You. It's a pleasure. And I'll see you soon, I'm sure. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. In person. Um, now, <laughs> everyone, you, please follow Ben as well. His Facebook page, Oxford International Study Centre, is more active than his Instagram, <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> but we'll try and post a lot more on Instagram now. Yes. We'll trying to do things like this because it's a good place but as you know, our facebook page is the best place for immediate updates absolutely and um i will share this video on our youtube channel and share the link with anyone who requests it so have a great night everyone thank you Perfect. thank you everyone for joining us bye for you lovely to see you bye, ben. lovely to see you as always bye